Good late morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. I would like to first thank organizers for inviting me here. It's a very interesting and mind-stimulating event. So my name is Michal Cifra, I was mentioned, and I'm from the Institute of Photonics and Electronics from the Czech Academy of Sciences. This is the bioelectrodynamics research team which, which I lead. In our team, we are a bunch of the people from different backgrounds, reaching from electrical engineering to the physical chemistry to the biophysics. And we explore, our mission is to explore the novel methods how to use electrodynamic and electronic approaches to develop potentially new methods in the treatment and diagnostics in the biomedicine and, and biotechnology. So to achieve our mission, we mostly focus on having deep understanding using different computational tools and nanotechnology experimental tools to probe electromagnetic properties of biological systems. And especially we are focusing in the radio frequency and optical band. So uh, this is the kind of uh, scientific scheme of our research. Um, as we uh, said, we're trying to first to give a sufficient understanding of the electromagnetic properties based on the theoretical predictions to understand how the electromagnetic field affects the biological systems. That's the passive properties and how and how the uh, or how the electromagnetic field reacts to the to the to the uh, how the biological systems react to the electromagnetic field. And then also we are developing theories and experiments to probe active electromagnetic properties of biological systems. That means the, how the biological systems generate the electromagnetic field. Uh, these theoretical works are then followed based on the prediction we get, um, are followed by the development using our different technological and micro fabrication tools. We develop chips and platforms to probe these properties which we predict. And then we mostly do and the experiments, we verify our theories on the level of the cells, on the level of the proteins, on the biomolecules. Um, today, I will focus on two stories because the time is short. So first I will speak in this map, which you can see here. Um, I mapped our research on the frequency scale. So first I will speak about the uh, dielectric function of biomolecules and the chips we developed to probe complex permittivity. This is the fundamental electromagnetic quantity of the biomaterials with the small, for small volumes and accurately and how to understand this electromagnetic quantity. And then I will speak about the endogenous biological chemical resistance. That's the phenomenon of, of the spontaneous emission of light from biological systems due to the biochemistry and metabolism which takes place in the organisms. So this is the first topic. We are in our team trying to understand the complex permittivity of biomolecule solutions because it's a fundamental key to understand how the electromagnetic field interacts with the, with the biomolecules or organisms at the biomolecular level. So the motivation for that uh, is related to our mission. So it's obvious that the knowledge of electromagnetic properties is crucial for development of a new electromagnetic therapeutic and diagnostic methods. Um, however, we believe that to develop this method, we need to understand the interaction of electromagnetic fields from the biomolecular level up. For this, we often need to probe purified samples, purified biomolecules, and these are often very, very expensive. So the, the goal is simple, to minimize the volume we need to probe the sample, because the commercial methods do not enable this at all. They require several milliliters, often several milligrams per milliliter concentration to probe the complex permittivity. Therefore, the goal of this part of the story, which I will explain to you, uh, is to develop accurate, small biosample volume and broadband dielectric spectroscopy, which has sufficient sensitivity in specific bands which depend on the biosystem probed, on the biomolecule probed. So this is the scheme which I will follow in, in this story. So first we probe, um, prob first we ask, we look on the biological sample, the biomolecule, and we ask, what are the spectral features we, etch, we expect this biomolecule will bring and where in which frequency band they are? Then we design the tool which should address this frequency band. Then we fabricate the tools for our chips and we test them. We obtain the complex permittivity data of the biomolecule solutions and we, ref and we check them with the reference independence tool if possible. And then we do not stop there just obtaining complex permittivity. Then we use molecular dynamic simulations to understand what complex permittivity actually of, this, of the data which we get, what it actually means 
for the movement of the biomolecules, and how they respond to electro electric field. Now this is basically the circle of the story which I will talk about. So to demonstrate the proof of principle here, I will show how we designed the chip which is, which, was, which, is, which is tuned to accurately measure the complex permittivity, the dielectric constant, and the, uh, the so solution of the alanine in the water. So we start with, we are lucky that we know how the alanine looks like, thanks to biochemists. So this is the alanine molecule, a small molecule. Uh, we only need to know for now uh, its size and actually its volume. Alanine is an important molecule because it's very common in all the proteins. And it is, well, as you know, the proteins are fundamental clockwork machine, machines in the biological systems. So um, once we know the molecule, uh, molecule volume, this can give us prediction in which frequency band we can expect the response of this molecule. This is very traditional and conventional. This is nothing controversial of this. We use approach of, at first, a simple analytical DBI model, which requires us to know, at first place, several parameters, and one of them is rotational diffusion time of the molecule. And this rotational diffusion time of the molecule is given by the viscosity of the environment, of the volume, the volume of the molecule, and the temperature, and of course some constants. And this brings us to the frequency band where the molecule rotational time will bring, up, bring about the, uh, the highest response. So when we plug in the numbers for the alanine, we will get uh, this frequency range for amino acids because they are rather similar in volume. This is this frequency range where they have the highest response in terms of um, imaginary part of complex permittivity. But also we would like to see the water signature. And that's why we need to have a broadband dielectric sensing which requires us that we have uh, sufficient sensitivity from sub gigahertz to at least 50 gigahertz and the highest intensity in the band of the, around, the, around the, the frequency of the alanine. So this is just the engineering part which I'll briefly describe. So this is how our chip looks like. We can drop a small drop of the, of, the, of the solution. These lines only basically demonstrate that we have very good fit when we design this chip between the simulation of the chip in the electromagnetic simulator and the, the measured data. Uh, here you can see the results of a different concentration of the complex permittivity of the, the different concentrations of the alanine in water. Here you can see just the pure water and Free concentration of alanine, 50, 100, 150 milligrams per milliliter. And here you can see the frequency. And this, uh, this axis is a real part of the, of the dielectric constant or uh, permittivity. This is the imaginary part. Real part refers to the polarizability of the, of the whole system. And imaginary part is, uh, refers to the losses, to thermal losses. This is classical interpretation of, of, the, of the system. Here you can see that the solid line is the reference bulk measurement, and the data from our chip, from our method, are uh, notified here by the dots. So there is a reasonable agreement through the spectra with some small deviations in the higher frequencies. But we can see that the chip works, so that's good. Um, now, when we develop the tool which can measure the complex permittivity from, in this case, 20-fold lower volume than the commercial methods that we uh, provide, we have to, we now the data from complex permittivity, what does it tell us about the behavior of, both of the biomolecules? So for this, we employed um, molecular dynamics, which basically uses this um, simple principles of interaction and the forces between the molecules, in a, and we put it into the simulation to the computer. And to, um, I don't want to go to the details. It's available to see in the literature how it's possible to do this. What is important is how this actually works and how we get the complex permittivity from the simulation. So how can we predict electromagnetic properties from the computational simulation? So here you can see the view on the individual boxes in our simulation. Um, all these flickering small dots are water molecules, the classical model, flickering model of the, of the water molecules. And these are individual molecules, the alanine. So we put different amounts of uh, of the alanine to achieve effectively different concentrations which correspond to which correspond to experiment. The arrow which you see flickering here is the arrow of the dipole moment of the total of all of the alanines. We of course can analyze any uh, dipole moment of any component of the system. So from this we run this uh, simulation for, for 50 times for each uh, scenario and then we get an average. 
And from that, we can calculate, by the trajectory, we can calculate the dipole moment autocorrelation function. And with some mass, we can, mathematics, we can then get uh, from the statistical physics principles, the susceptibility, which is related directly to the complex permittivity of, of the of the system. So, this is our these are our results. So you can see that there is semi-quantitative uh, agreement between the experimental data and this dashed line are the data from complex permittivity. It overestimates the permittivity of the water, which is which is explainable in terms of the water model which is used there, but still it graphs semi-quantitatively, uh, it covers the features which, are, which we see here. For example, one of the features is that the, the peak due to the water molecule rotation, which is around 20 gigahertz for the room temperature, slightly shifts to the lower frequencies. And even more interesting things we see when we look on the contributions of the individual components, that means bulk water, water which is close to the biomolecule, so kind of restricted motion water, and the amine, and the biomolecule itself. And he, this is only possible in computational experiment, as we say, that we can decompose the contributions to the electromagnetic response of the individual si uh, system, individual components of the system. So here you can see the, the, how the individual components behave. This is the total response, is a, is a solid line. Then contribution of the alanine to the uh, to the real part, the imaginary part of the here susceptibility is plotted in a dashed line. Then the, this line um, uh, and, and I'll, I'll denotes the contribution of the water. What is interesting, which is completely not intuitive, at least at this, uh, as we thought first, there is contribution to the electromagnetic response due to the cross correlation, so the interaction between the water and the biomolecule. And this is more significant. The more significant, the more significant, the higher concentration of the biomolecule. And I don't want to go too much in detail, but this is very interesting and we, uh, we are working on that to understand this deeper. So the take-home message for this part is that we have developed and tested a chip which uh, enables us to, pr and the method, which enables us to probe the complex permittivity. So this is basic material quantity, which determines the response of the electric component of electromagnetic field, uh, the response of the biomolecules and the uh, system which is complex system like uh, biomolecules in the water. And this is possible to do with now with much lower volumes than commercial available. So this opens us a whole new possibilities to probe uh, the, the electromagnetic properties of such a samples which could not have been probed before because they were simply not uh, available in sufficiently large numbers, well, volumes. And then important, second important message here is that uh, we implemented the molecular dynamic simulations to actually interpret data of the complex permittivity which we obtain with our chips. The second story I would like to mention is related to our work on uh, active electromagnetic properties of biological systems. What I mean with active, as I noted in the beginning, is how uh, biological systems can generate electromagnetic field. So this topic is related to the question how uh, biological systems generate light. So if we know this is the fact so I will start the definition, with the definition. So I'm speaking here about endogenous biological chemiluminescence. So what does it mean? It is the luminescence from biological systems where electron excited species, those species which can emit photons when they relax to the ground state, are formed due to the oxidation of endogenous biomolecules. So um, this is a phenomenon which takes place in the whole the visible range, basically, and is of very low intensity. Approximate scheme of reactions which lead to this photon emission is here. I will go to the detail in later slides. Um, this phenomenon is uh, synonymous in our understanding to the to the other terms you can find in the literature. The, one of the most common is ultra weak photon emission. This is also a common abbreviation I might use in the later slides. So it'll be UPE, ultra weak photon emission. And also we can find the terminology as like biophotons or biological autoluminescence and so on. I would like to stress here, this, is, this phenomenon is not thermal radiation. It is really genuine luminescence, but produced without external excitation with the external light. It's simply light produced due to the endogenous biochemical or metabolic activity of the biological systems. 
um, to put you into the scales to understand how what is the intensity of this light is. So here you can see you can choose your favorite units of the uh, flux of the of the of the light or intensity of the light, and um, you can see here if you compare the sensitivity of the ordinary human visual function that much how much you can see with the naked eye even if it's dark accommodated. This is the ranges you can see. These are the different common visible phenomena, and um, here you can see what is the intensity of this ultra-weak photon emission, or as I also call it, endogenous biological, biological chemical luminescence. So it's a few orders of magnitude lower than the ordinary human eye can see. So that's why we cannot see it by uh, naked eye. And we need some sensitive devices. But to put you into even more graspable uh, scales of, of intensity, uh, let me take you for a small trip. I mean, it can take a few minutes for that to the International Space Station. Now, imagine you are an astronaut, like this lady, in the International Space Station, and you are looking down to the Earth, on our beautiful blue planet. You light up the lighter, or the candle. Well, in the zero gravity, it would look probably more like this. And you light it up in the window of the International Space Station. Now, this light generates roughly this amount of photons per centimeter square of the, of the fire and per second. So it's quite a large number of particles of light which is emitted from this source. It's a point source, so it spreads all around in a spherical wave-like manner. Now, why I'm telling you to do this, I'm, I'm trying to, what I'm trying to ask you now is imagine that this light propagates from the International Space Station somewhere far above us which is roughly 400 kilometers, down to the Sofia. Let's say in the night, if it's completely dark, which is not the case, but if it's completely dark, and you just walk up one of the top, top buildings in Sofia, can you imagine how much photons come from this distance down here? How many photons is that? It's probably a little number, so I will not let you guess for too long. It's roughly 60 photons per centimeter square per second. If you forget any clouds, any absorption, any scattering, just because of the light spreads from the source, from a, sphere, from a spherical, uh, spherical wave-like manner. So this is low intensity, as you can see, 60 photons. Why am I telling you this? This is roughly the order of magnitude of the light which is being emitted continuously from the biological systems. So it's very, very weak light. However, there are ways how to detect it. Um, so you can imagine that this is actually how that much light as we are, you can imagine trying to see in an international space station in the window of the international space, international space station flying above us. So it's a very small amount of light. So we, but we can detect it. Now here I borrowed some beautiful images from our colleagues from uh, Japan and Netherlands. So there are basically two basic ways how to detect very weak light. Uh, not only biological, but any type of the light. Either we can uh, use the imaging, which for example in this case of this uh, well, here, you have the human hands, you can get a nice image, which is important, especially if the object you want to, well, analyze the light from is not homogeneous. And this is from the, as I mentioned, from the Professor Kobayashi and Roland Van Wyck and collaborators. And, or, or you can just detect the, com the total light you get from the sample. So then you get actually a time series. There are both advantages of the advantages of these approaches, well described in the literature. So to go to the mechanisms, what generates the light? This is often a question for, for a scientist to understand what does it mean, this, what does this light mean? I will explain you some details on the mechanism. So, so far as we understand, this is, the, this is the accepted paradigm for this very weak photon emission. This photon emission comes from the, from the oxidative um, and free radical reactions. So you can imagine there is an oxidant, there is a biomolecule, they react, after several more steps, um, they produce an excited state, the product in electronically excited state. So roughly you can imagine like in a scheme of the energy like this. And then this excited electron, when it's with some conditions, it uh, goes down to the ground level, it emits a photon. So it's as easy as that. So there is no external light needed, just the chemical energy, which is there present in biological systems so basically all the time. And the oxygen is needed typically. So uh, these uh, oxidative processes have uh, different sources in the cells and organisms. For example, um, the indigenous oxidative metabolism is taking place in mitochondria, in plants, in chloroplasts, and in other organelles. But 
but the oxidation is also influenced by the external condition, especially when the, when the organism is under stress. So there are different types of stresses which can act on uh, organisms from animals to plants, either abiotic or biotic stresses, and these can modulate, typically they increase the oxidative stress, and that increases the uh, chemiluminescence which we observe. So this is the still very simplified chemical scenario of what's, what's taking place in the generation of the endogenous light. So typically in the beginning there needs to be uh, some oxidation of the biomolecule. Here biomolecule the R refers to almost any biomolecule, but the reaction constant of course tremendously, many orders of magnitude vary from biomolecule to biomolecule. So this scheme is generally true, but the amount of and speed of individual pathways depends on the individual molecules. What is important here are the intermediates, so-called dioxetines or tetraoxides, which are, uh, which are intermediate steps. And these are rather unstable molecules which can be decomposed. Um, and then they produce um, electronically excited species. One of the primary species which is produced and which is known to be produced is uh, triplet carbonyl, which is itself a rather poor emitter unless positioned on a special molecular group. So therefore it often transfers the energy to the oxygen, that's why often single oxygen is generated, which is, uh, which is known, and, and it also can transfer energy to other chromophores or directly emit if there is nothing, if there, there is no way how to transfer the energy. So these different emitters bring about different colors of the emission, the different wavelengths. Um, these, have been dark, these, have been, these have been work done with collaborators from the biophysics department in the uh, University of Olomouc in our country, Czech Republic. So we have identified, the, as I mentioned, the, the emitters uh, in the literature or from our work, partially identified the emitters and their wavelengths they emit. So because you can see, you can see there that all the uh, visible ranges covered by different types of, of emitters which can be positioned on different molecules. So this gives basically rather rich rich um, spectral content uh, of this ultraviolet photon emission. So these are these, what I mentioned, the possibilities of the energy transfer from different, let's say from triplet carbonyl to, to, the, uh, to the other acceptors which can then re-emit the energy in different wavelength bands. In our group we wanted to have a quantitative understanding of this phenomenon and we realized it's very complicated because there is very complicated chemistry behind it. Anyway, we tried to develop a conceptual model which at least identifies what are the steps that we can then, when we know what are the important steps, we can try to quantify them. So this is still not a complete story, but the framework is valid, I would guess correct. Uh, but the numbers might differ depending on what system you are looking on. So in the beginning there is an oxygen which is consumed by different, uh, different uh, subsystem in the cell and this can produce reactive oxygen species, they can be scavenged or not. If they are not scavenged and they can react faster than being scavenged by the antioxidants, they produce these uh, intermediate species and these then uh, can decompose to the already mentioned excite, electron excited state and these then emit photons. Anyway, what is the message here that for an average cell, however silly this might sound for a biologist, for an average cell, the average diameter or it's average metabolism, the roughly the order of magnitude of the photons emitted per cell is only one photon per 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes. Very, very, very low intensity. So we can only observe this phenomenon if we have sufficient amount of cells, the sufficient, the sample is sufficiently big. Okay, so we demonstrated recently that uh, this phenomenon can be related to the uh, metabolism. So here you can see the photon emission from the growing, uh, growing yeast cell culture. When the yeast cells run out of the glucose, the signal drops down, this photon emission signal drops down. When they inject the glucose again, the signal recovers, and then again, the glucose runs out, the signal again drops down. We also demonstrated that this, um, this is not only related to metabolism, this ultraviolet photon emission, this chemiluminescence, but it's related to the oxidative metabolism, because when we inject antioxidants to a sample, here, this chemiluminescence from uh, human leukemia cells, HL60, um, if we inject antioxidants, the signal drops. So this indirect indication, the oxidation process is important. So when we remove the oxidation, the chemical medicine intensity drops. We also demonstrated with collaborators from the University of Leiden that there is a correlation with the oxidative metabolites using metabolomic studies and the photon emission. 
And recently, this is still a project, an ongoing project, we have shown that we can also demonstrate, we showed it earlier, that we can not only detect the indigenous, indigenous signal from the hand, but also we can demonstrate that if we apply oxidative stress on the hand, for example, using the hydrogen peroxide, there is increased signal, and if we apply hydrogen peroxide and antioxidant, the signal decreases. So this again confirms the basic hypothesis that this, can, this signals, photon emission signals, comes from the oxidative reactions, at least from those. Recently, again, another interesting NGOI project is that we can use this light phenomenon to probe the perturbation caused by external electromagnetic field. So we combine now both, let's say, both uh, research areas which we are doing, uh, doing uh, research in. So the idea is here, when we, if one applies intense electric pulses, sufficiently intense to cause oxidation of biomolecules, then we know that oxidation biomolecules causes, as one of the products, also chemiluminescence. So we actually used this, this very simplified scheme. Um, we wanted to test if it works. So we, so we did in collaboration with um, Dr. Louis Mir from Village Week from France. And just give, briefly give you preliminary data here. So this is the uh, chemiluminescence signal or the ultraweak photon emission signal from, from the uh, DC3F cells in very high concentrations here. And what we do here, we apply the electric pulses. We have total, we have same duration, the two scenarios, the same total duration, but the way how we apply the field differs. In one scenario, we apply single very long pulse, five millisecond pulse. In another scenario, we apply 20, uh, 250 microsecond pulses. So when you do the simple algebra mass, it is the same duration. However, since uh, the pulses act in a slightly different manner, they give time, some time between the pulses, and this gives, leaves a time for some chemistry to happen. What we see, that the cell uh, chemiluminescence is different for a single long pulse compared to the multiple short pulses. This is actually very interesting, and there, it has a, have a physical chemistry explanation because there is, as I said, time for the diffuse molecule and to be available for oxidation again. So with this, I would like to give you a second take home message before I conclude my lecture, that uh, we know now that uh, the endogenous biological chemiluminescence is a well, well-proven phenomenon. There is nothing controversial about it apart the details of the chemical mechanism, but there is well-accepted um, chemical paradigm behind it. And we know it's related to the relaxation of chemically excited electron species, which, are, which can be generated endogenously, but also external factors can perturb the system so it changes the intensity or parameters of this, of this photon emission. So, um, and we believe that this, diag this method can be developed prospectively in a, to the diagnostics of oxidative stress. The oxidative stress is very important in the different diseases. We didn't go into the biomedical details, but the specialists know is important in a development of neurodegenerative diseases and cardiovascular diseases as well. So it's important to have a, a reasonable, easy ways how to monitor oxidative stress. And this method enables to monitor oxidative stress in a way which is non-invasive, almost real time. And it's rather low operation cost when you have the device, you don't need to have any reagents to monitor the endogenous signals, and it's label free. The only drawback is that the sensitivity is that you have to have sufficiently big sample, which is fulfilled nevertheless in case of larger sample like uh, pieces of the tissue or the human body. So with this, I would like to thank you for attention. I would be glad to take any questions.